All right. Um, if you want to follow along, find my speaker deck. Uh, it's at Data Engineering for Data Scientists. Uh, I find it really helpful when speakers upload their slides, so you can follow through. I go a little bit quickly. Um, I'm going to try not to this time. I wanted to start with this tweet from David Smith. Oh, sure. You can just, <laughs> honestly, just Google my name, Max Humber, speaker deck, you'll find it. Everyone cool? Okay, I'm moving on. So David Smith is a developer advocate at Microsoft, um, and he had this really brilliant tweet, tweet back in February. So it's all about like writing your proposal and actually coming to the conference, and often what you propose is kind of different from what you actually wanted to do. So this is what I pitched. Um, I wanted to talk about one-upping your data science workflow, talking about how you can build your models in such a way that it, they won't break in production, talk about logging, uh, command line interfaces, and testing. So I'm actually going to deliver on 90% of this promise, but the talk is much different from what I originally imagined, I think for the better. Um, to start, we should talk about what is a data engineer. So quickly Googling, I found this image. Um, not super helpful. So I, I can see like a code icon, there's a gear, an iPad. I've never used an iPad in what I do. Um, so instead of talking about what data engineers, I can talk exactly about what I do as a data engineer. Um, it's a lot of AWS, like a lot of AWS. Uh, a lot of Git, it's a lot of Docker, um, especially with Miniconda images. Um, a lot of databases, like so many databases. Um, a lot of Python and a lot of data pipelines. Um, but perhaps more useful is to think about data engineering through the lens of the data hierarchy of needs. Um, so this is a really, I think, interesting and useful way to look at data. Of course, everyone wants to do the bits at the top, sexy AI, deep learning, machine learning stuff. But you can't actually do that without the base of the pyramid. So data engineering is all about the, pit, the bits in purple. I'm gonna touch on a few of these concepts, um, primarily doing some ETL, doing, working with some training data, building up features, um, and talking about logging. Uh, but really, the motivation for this talk is many of you probably work within an organization where your data team is like just you, or it's you and another person, or it's less than five people. So you won't have a data engineer. So you're gonna have to do these pieces yourself in order to get to the top of the period, pyramid and reach like self-actualization, um, that being AI. So the talk is gonna follow this format. I'm gonna talk about um, .py files, talk about data defense, talk about logging and command line interfaces, and there's a bit of, surpri of a surprise at the end, um, but we'll get to that. So given that this is a talk about data, I need data to talk about data. Um, so if it's all right with you, I found this really interesting data set called the Titanic data set. Um, so it's about 2,000 people. Um, they were actually on the Titanic. I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, I'm not talking about Titanic. Please don't ever talk about Titanic. Um, <laughs> I'm going to follow Tim Dobbins' lead and use some very like personal data. So I've been riding my bike to work for the past six months. Um, I don't know if many of you are from Austin, but you guys have those B cycles. In Toronto, we have the Toronto uh, Bike Share. So we basically have uh, this web portal where you can go on and scrape your own data. So this is mine. Uh, it's got timestamp information. Um, I've cleaned up the labels, but essentially there's like seven different options. I can be picking up a bike from work, from home, going to my climbing gym, um, going to my art class. But essentially what I want to try to do throughout this presentation is based on these inputs, um, how can we figure out where I'm going to go. So what this kind of looked like at the beginning, um, this is not the important stuff. I'm just giving a little preamble. Essentially, the website allowed me to pick up all of the dock information that I uh, parked my bike. Those are the bits in gray, and then the reds are the points of interest. So after doing a bit of clustering, um, I basically figured out like, hey, if the bits in blue down in the left-hand corner, um, if I parked my bike there, I was likely going to my climbing gym. Um, if it's down in, over in the pink, the other side, uh, I was likely at my art class. So this is what the actual data looks like on top of the real landscape of Toronto. Um, so we're essentially gonna turn this presentation to a where's Waldo, but it's gonna be like, where's Max going? Um, and so with that, let's actually do this. So hot tip number one, if you wanna do some actual data engineering, lose the notebook. Uh, I love Jupyter as much as the next person, but it has some problems. Um, so Jupyter's really great because you can take this flat file, drop it in, 
and start executing code in mine. So I can load it up with pandas, uh, do a little bit of peeking at it, and essentially do some transformations. But whereas Jupyter is really great for exploratory analysis, it's really great for visualizing ideas, quick prototyping, it's pretty garbage at versioning. It's really garbage uh, at moving your stuff into production, and it quickly gets pretty messy. If you're writing some really elaborate um, and complex Python code, you need to split this, those out into like different sub-modules. Um, you can't have those in like two different, or three different, or four different uh, dot .ipy and b file formats. You need to actually be, work be working with .py. Um, so if you wanna move to .py, Jupyter comes with this really fantastic command line tool, mb convert. And essentially, you can take your uh, Jupyter notebook, pass it through this uh, two script uh, file format argument, and then it'll spit out your code like this. Except that's not super useful because you're giving up so much in moving to .py from a Jupyter notebook. You're giving up the interactivity, you're giving up um, perhaps the inline and like exploratory stuff, but it actually doesn't have to be like that. Uh, you can actually quit Jupyter Notebooks without actually having to quit Jupyter Notebooks. So, has anyone heard of hydrogen here? If I show hands, a few? Okay, awesome. Hydrogen is something that I think more people need to know about. So, hydrogen is essentially a plugin for the Atom uh, text editor. What it allows you to do is when you install this plugin, which is super lightweight, you can effectively have the power of a Jupyter kernel. Um, execute code according to the Jupyter protocol, so that's I think zero MQ, and what this allows you to do is you take your code in the editor, this is a .py file, s highlight and select, and go command enter, and it's pretty much exactly like executing a code cell. So this is really neat because you can take your like data frame object, highlight the little bit, so my DF object, and I can immediately see inline what's in there. This is like especially useful for later down in the pipeline when you're splitting out your stuff into testing and training. So I can immediately highlight X test and see exactly what is in there by just pr pressing command enter. So this is what the data will look like. So hot tip number one for uh, data engineering for data scientists, lose a notebook, not the kernel, Jupyter's great, but seriously, please check out hydrogen. Uh, my second tip is getting defensive about building your models. So given this is the data that we're playing with, um, we need to, of course, predict on top of something, so to predict where I'm gonna drop off the bike with the bits in purple. And you can see line 279, I essentially picked up my bike in the West Core, dropped it off at my climbing gym, went climbing, picked it back up from climbing, um, and this was all at like 623, of course, I'm probably gonna go home at this point. So with these pieces of information, how can I like translate that into something that a machine can actually read? Um, well, you can use a label binnerizer from sklearn preprocessing. Uh, and so if you take the column pickup from your X train object, you can transform it with some like one hot encoding, right? This is pretty standard. What happens though, when your column has some NA values? Like this is pretty common. Um, your stuff quickly becomes a, a fiery mess. So if this is in production, you've got NA values kind of slipping through, stuff is gonna blow up um, and you need to protect against that. So this is all about getting defensive. My second um, recommendation is check out sklearn pandas. So this is from the sklearn um, contribution repository. Uh, with sklearn you get two really brilliant things. So you get a data frame mapper and a categorical imputer. So with the pieces that we're using to predict, primarily being time, pickup, last drop off, last pickup, I'm gonna set uh, the last pickup and last drop off as optional, so those can be uh, null values, and I'm gonna make time and pickup um, absolutely required. So this essentially means like, okay, create me a data frame mapper from sklearn pandas. Uh, I need you to keep time and pickup so do no transformations, that's why you see none. And then for the bits in last drop off, last pickup, do some categorical imputing if those values don't exist. So it behaves much like sklearn, where you establish the mapper and then you fit it on top of your training data. And so with new data, you can actually do the transform and take your data frame object, stuff it inside, and say, okay, with the pieces set to none, 
for last drop off and last pickup, it'll automatically just set these things to home and home because I'm, I'm probably going home um, as that's my most frequent pickup and drop off spot. So, of course, this is not machine readable. A machine can't do anything with work home or home. What do we do with that? Well, we already kind of know. Uh, we've got to turn it into some one-hot encoding. What's really, really nice about the data frame mapper is it allows you to do some transformations um, kind of chained together. So essentially, you can just drop in your label binarizers on top of the bits that you already had, uh, transform it, and this is what the output will look like. Uh, we need to deal with that timestamp thing, though. That's pretty messy. So the other th really great thing about the data frame mapper is it allows you to um, kind of nest in your own transformers. So from sklearn base, we can uh, grab a date encoder. So this is something that I'm just creating on the fly. It's going to have a fit method and a transform method. And the bit that you should only be concerned about is I basically take the timestamp and uh, with some date time accessors, I grab the month, the day of week, and the hour. And then when I pass that through my custom date encoder uh, method, I essentially transform it into something like this. So now I have all the pieces for my data frame mapper. I've got a date encoder for the time, a uh, label binarizer for the pickup. I'm not doing any categorical imputing on that because like, I need to have the pickup location, but the last two bits, again, are optional. So if there are null values, I'll set them to categorical um, imputation, and then I'll transform all that into some one-hot encoding. So this is what it'll look like. This is gonna make a machine very happy. So taking uh, a new piece of data that you haven't seen, uh, given this timestamp, so this is April 1st uh, at 9.30, given that I just picked it up at work, um, where's, where am I gonna go? This is the signature that we've passed to the model. And again, your machine will be happy. Uh, tip three is all about logging, so especially logging all the things. Uh, you might have noticed that there's a problem with this new data. Um, especially with that last pickup point. So that Icelandic looking word, which is not a word, this is just me mashing on my computer, uh, that might cause some problems downstream. Uh, and so that would actually pass through the model and work, but I'd wanna know about that. Um, <laughs> there's some really great data validation libraries out there. One that I particularly like, like is called Cer Cerberus. Uh, so it's pip install Cerberus. And what this allows you to do is you essentially describe your data as a dictionary. So I've got my pickup, my time, uh, the last drop off point, and the last pickup point. And then I describe what each of those pieces, or rather keys inside the dictionary should look like. So the schema is defined above. And you essentially say, hey, the time needs to be uh, as a date time object. It can't be null. And then for pickup, you've got these seven different options. So I can either be picking up a bike at home, at work, uh, at my climbing gym, in the west core, the downtown core, other, or at uh, where I do my art. And then uh, for the last bits, you set nullable to true, where those can be null values. So with, again, a new piece of information, you can uh, basically instantiate a validator, run the method dot validate with your example data and then your schema and it will pop out no errors, so that's great. Here's a bad example, so pickup is nonsense, there's no value for time, uh, last drop off is not a string when it should be, uh, the only bit that actually works is the last pickup point, so passing that through this validator object um, will spit out all these different errors. There's a problem though, because you're probably working with pandas data frames and not dictionaries, so how do you extend Cerberus to actually work with this? Um, it's actually quite trivial. So data frames actually have this really great method called toDict, uh, and essentially when you run that method, it generates something that looks exactly like a dictionary, except the bits are uh, nested inside of lists, so we're gonna have to deal with that. But we can ex essentially create our own pandas validator, which inherits from the validator object from Cerberus. And the bits that you need to be concerned about here are we are uh, re, what's the word, recreating the validate method. Um, so at the very end, we're gonna call super from it, but we're taking the data frame object, converting it to the dictionary that we need, and then uh, we pass that 
through the transform schema uh, method, which we create down below, which basically takes all the bits inside of um, the schema that we defined and pushes them through to like a list. Uh, so that looks like this. The schema exa is exactly the same. The data frame object basically nests everything inside of the lists that we need. And then when you run pandas validator and then call the dot validate, you'll see that, okay, we had one problem where time was null, we're gonna have to fix that. So if this model is running in production, uh, if we're logging it, now we have something to log, there's an error, uh, how do you actually grab when something goes bad? Uh, how do you actually access those logs? So my preferred way is through rulebar. Rulebar is not just the ad at the beginning of the Talk Python podcast where you just skip through. It's actually like super useful, um, and it's super free for up to 5,000 events. Using it is the simplest thing ever. Uh, you essentially import rollbar, initialize it with your key, and then run through the code that you want to run through. So this is calling on the pandas validator that we created from before, running dot validate, spitting out the errors, and then if the errors are populated, you pass it to rollbar through the report, me report message method, um, and then it basically goes to rollbar, and you can see when something causes a conflict. Um, now you've got a happy panda. <laughs> Uh, hot tip number four, learn how to CLI. So basically for data scientists, you're often taking an object, doing some transform, spinning it out, but those are mostly hard quoted. So it would be nice if you could adjust the input variables and where they're located, as well as where it's meant to go. Um, in the abstract I submitted for this, I wanted to talk about click. I no longer recommend click. It's a really great tool, but there's something that I think is better and it's called Python Fire. So Python Fire is an unofficial Google product. I think it's in the Google repository. Install it with pip install fire or through conda install fire, uh, conda forge. What this allows you to do is you can basically take your script that does the transforms or the predictions or whatever else. So right now I'm reading in a static file called maxbikedata.csv. Uh, I'm running a silly predict function which basically says, okay, if the hour is um, less than 10, just predict that I'm gonna go to work. If it's greater than that, predict I'm gonna go home. And then it spits out some accuracy, and then actually turns to the predictions and drops it into an output.csv file. It would be nice to actually take different pieces of information and not send it to an output file or have just Mike's back, max bike data in, but maybe like Sonny's bike data or your bike data. So we can refactor this code quickly, uh, pull out the actual predict function, and build um, the code in a way that allows us to pipe it through a command line interface. But essentially, all that's changed is now predict takes a file argument instead of a static file. So when you want to turn this into a CLI, don't blink because it happens very quickly. Uh, all you need to do is import fire. Um, and at the very end, call the object. So what this does is it transforms the entire uh, script into a command line tool so that you can run Python model.py, the predict function, so that's this big block right there, and then you pass in the argument max bike data. And so if you wanna do it for other pieces of information, you can run, okay, mybikedata.csv, Sunny's bike data, uh, CSV. And I think that's like pretty magic. Whereas with click, uh, there's a lot of decorators and you've got to deal with all this other nonsense. Um, Python Fire is the closest thing to magic that I think exists. Uh, I'm a little nervous about this part. I've been doing talks for a while, but I've never done um, a live demo. So this was initially supposed to be a piece on logging and Git, but you suck at Git and logging and it's not your fault. So as I was developing this presentation, I was taking all the bits that I use for work, and I was like, wait, this is pretty interesting. I can package this up into an open source project and allow everyone to have access to it. So as data scientists, we have a problem because we're expected to use Git for our code, but we also have to manage um, the model hyperparameters and perhaps data as well. There's not really a great story for those last two. So Git does a really good job for managing your code. Um, it's not really great for managing 
um, your model hyperparameters, especially when you're tuning like the littlest thing. Instead of like six branches, you might drop it down to four and then you rerun it and you assess the performance. But it would be nice to have a record of all those different changes um, so you can rewind, show your boss what you did, um, and kind of fast forward through that. So I'm calling it Memify. It's kind of a homage to Pickle. It's built exactly on top of Git. There's nothing new. Um, there are no ex external dependencies. It's pretty, pretty lightweight, um, but I think it's really cool. So here's my stupid logo. I was procrastinating building for these slides, so that's what it looks like. Um, here is the live demo part. <laughs> um, quick disclaimer, I have a little bit of training wheels, so I'm gonna flop back and forth, but we'll see how this goes. So we're working with the same data. Um, this is the Atom text editor with the hydrogen plugin, so I'll show you how that works. Essentially, I can highlight and run all this code, go command enter, it will fire up a Jupyter kernel, and then it will give me all the pieces that I need. So, oh, let's take a look at X, X test. That's what it looks like, great. Um, but now we need to assess how well this model does. First, let's actually build the model. So I'm gonna grab um, a K ne nearest neighbors classifier, stick it at the bottom, and all I'm gonna do is call Python model.py. So great, it printed the testing accuracy and the training accuracy, but nothing's actually happened. So when we make a change now or we swap in the classifier, I won't have access to that performance. Let me blow this up a little bit more. So now when I grab a random forest classifier, swap that in for the K nearest neighbors classifier, and I run this again, the training uh, accuracy went up, uh, the testing went down, but I really have no record of what I did before that because I'm gonna have to commit this to Git. Um, committing this to Git after every single model change is gonna be exhausting, you're gonna hate your life, so don't. All you need to do is import mummify, which you can grab by pip install mummify. And then at the very end, where I'm printing my training and testing accuracy, you replace this bit with mummify.log, save the model, rerun it. You'll see mummify was successfully initialized, and what you got in running that function at the very end is this log file called mummify.log, it's giving you an identifier, and then all the pieces of information that are attached to that. So <coughs> what it did is it instantiated basically a separate Git repository. So if you're using Git within your model, um, it'll still work perfectly well. You've just got this .mummify folder, uh, which is literally just Git, but renamed, um, and I'm handling all the heavy lifting in the back end. But now, when I swap in a new model, like a very primitive neural network. I can drop this in, save the file, rerun the model, and you can see that the performance dropped. So now I can go into mummify.log and see the performance as I move through. The coolest thing about this, I think, is <clears throat> when you run a change, so let's bump up um, the number of iterations this neural network has. So we're just gonna swap this in right here. Save the file, rerun the model. Uh, it improved on both the training and testing. The log file was changed so now we have a different identifier. You can actually run from the command line now, mummify history, if I can spell right. Uh, and you can see all the different changes that you made where the real kind of sexy stuff that this package comes in is when you need to make a switch. So the model that we ran at the very beginning um, was uh, K nearest neighbors network and then we moved into the random forest. So if I grab this identifier here and I go mummify switch, paste that in. Now it did some heavy lifting Git in the back, but it basically kept the log file as it exists 
and it changed my model back to the random forest. So <laughs> if I want to make a change now, maybe I'm like, ah, I don't want to do um, random forest. I actually really want to go back to the K nearest neighbors and play around with hyperparameters there. Uh, I can run this. Again, run Python model.py. Okay, that made the performance worse. Let's drop that down. Let's try four neighbors, see if that works. Run model.py again. Um, didn't really help. The random forest seems to have been performing better as well. So I'm going to, again, go back to that model and start messing around with the hyperparameters there. So I can go mummify switch. Cool. For this iteration, I'm going to bump up the number of estimators. So drop this in. I'm going to run, again, this is a little repetitive, I'm sorry, python model.py. And you can see that uh, with my logging function, and if I view history at the same time, you can see all the different changes I made. I kind of bounce back and forth, um, but I'm actually getting performance that seems to be overtrained. So the first model really was the best performing. Um, what I get though is now I can show my boss, okay, this is exactly what I did. This is how I did it. If I need to swap back and forth between like a Keras model and XG boost model, if I were to just use git to do this, I'd do like a git revert and I'd lose all of that progress because it's not saving the branches as I go. Um, I think that this is tremendously powerful and it becomes tremendously powerful when you start building um, new, I guess, scripts inside of this folder. So when we run this, I, I'm satisfied with it. I'm gonna drop in um, pickle, so I'm gonna dump out the pipe, which I'm building here, and the label binarizer. I'll rerun that once more. So python model.py. Saved everything for me. Uh, now I can predict on top of new data. So I'm gonna build a, a new predict file. So this is, I guess, very similar to what you saw from, I think it was section four, uh, but if I save this as predict.py, instead of running python model.py, I can actually access the dot mummify git repository with like regular git flavored um, syntax. So those bits are here. All that's different is I can go git uh, status, but I actually have to point it to, oh, this is actually in the dot mummify git directory. So I run that, you can see, oh, your stuff in predict.py hasn't been committed, so we can actually run git add. Oops. And then git commit. predict file, and now get status again, and everything's clean. So let's create some data, see where I'm gonna go, because this was, where's Waldo, but where's Max? Um, when we run new data.csv, and save that, I can now run Python predict uh, new data.csv. And so given that it's uh, 2018, April the 9th at 9.15, given that the last pickup, or rather the pickup point was at home, um, the last drop off point was at other, and the last pickup point was at home, where am I going to go? Uh, you can probably guess just based on the timestamp. Oh no. Spell something wrong. Oh, I did. Python predict dot pi new data dot csv. Max is probably going to work. So what this looks like again is you've got uh, this mummify import at the very beginning. 
You've got mummify.log where you can stuff any message in here, really. Uh, it instantiates for you a new Git repository and then this really awesome mummify.log file where you can kind of swap back and forth. And then from the command line, you can call mummify history to see all the changes that you've made. So this is a really lightweight tool. Um, but I think if you're just mucking around, um, it could be really powerful for you. I've been using it now for two weeks at work and it's made me incredibly more productive. Um, yeah, check it out. Before I wrap up, um, maybe next time I won't do it with training wheels, but again, this is the first time. I hope that wasn't too painful. The plug, uh, so you can check out the Git repository at Max Humber Mummify. You can pip install with pip install mummify, or I just put up on conda, so conda install Max Humber Mummify. Um, and before I wrap up, uh, I want to say thanks to these wonderful people who made, uh, who, who rather make my day so much better every single day. So L Geiger, who basically maintains the hydrogen plugin, um, Andreas Mueller, who runs Scikit-Learn, uh, Nikolai, who does Cerberus, and then Duke Body, who runs um, SKLearn Pandas. But really, if you've contributed to any of these packages, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to Anaconda for having me. It's been a really wonderful conference so far. I'm excited to learn more. The food's been awesome, um, too. The food is so good. <laughs> Uh, and just as a shameless plug, so please use Mummify. I'm actually writing a book right now. Uh, if you go on to leanpump.com slash personal finance with Python, use that promo code. Um, I'm basically working towards the end of the month to chop down some trees and get this printed on paper. But if you use that coupon code, you'll get it for free. So that's all I have. Thank you much, so much for your time and attention. Um, I hope you found this useful. <laughs> All right, we're ready to take some questions if you're interested, but before we take our first, um, if you could fill out the survey cards um, on your desk in front of you. It does require a pen, I'm afraid they aren't touch screen enabled. Um, just leave them on your desk when you're done and that would help us to know uh, how y'all, what y'all thought of the talk. But uh, thank you very much, a lot of really interesting stuff. I already got to peek at uh, the Mummify repo while you cool. were talking and I'm looking forward to checking it out more. Um, any questions for Max? Okay, I'm, I've, I've got you, I promise, but I'm gonna work my way back. In the uh, mummify log file, is there a way that you could maybe denote the unique IDs or is that just kind of, like so, could, so like if you've got one you know is like, yeah, I know this one's a pretty particularly good, like this is my baseline. And then so if you wanna switch back, you can just say switch baseline, for example. Let me show you what's going on. Um, essentially, all I've done is, if you remember at the beginning, I transformed my print functions from print um, whatever it was into mummify.log. You can basically write whatever you want in here. So you can say, oh, this is my baseline. And then I can run uh, mummify, oh rather, python model.py. I missed my dot. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So it will go to the log file, and you can see you can print whatever you want in there. Uh, what my intention for this package is, I like Git is really complex, um, and there are so many different options. But really, all you need to do is commit and switch. And so I've abstracted all of that away from you, and I'm really only giving you access to those three functions. So I don't want you to mess around with these identifiers. Um, this is generated just with the UID, uh, but you can have free reign on the message that you commit to the mummify log, if that's fair. Um, so are you able to uh, take your mummify repo and publish it to a GitHub or GitLab, and what would that look like? Yeah, absolutely. So actually, I really love to use source tree. I can show you why this is exactly just Git. I can drag and drop mummify into here. And I can see, okay, yeah, this is just vanilla Git. I've just abstracted away that functionality. So if you want to use source tree, you can just push that up. But I think the intention for .mummify is you're gonna have your regular uh, .git folder. The mummify bit will just keep track of every little single tweak that you've done to your model. Um, so you, you probably wanna have two different git um, repositories in there, do your regular git stuff as you would, and just have mummify running in the background.
Yeah, you might might want to have a um, an ignore for the you know. I imagine if you have a mummify directory and a git directory, you know, you you might want to ignore the some of the git files within the mummify oh, or vice yeah, versa, yeah. right? Um, that is a excellent point. So when you instantiate mummify, you actually do get a git ignore, and so I actually hide mummify from your regular git folder. But sure, like absolutely stick the stuff um, in there that you don't want mummify to track. Yeah. Um, just to automate all of that logic is like next to impossible. I don't know what you're going to add. Mm -hmm. So it's available to you, but excellent point. Really and, good then, point. and then a quick question about hydrogen. Yeah. Can, can, I know that's a Jupyter kernel, but can you plot visualizations and stuff like that? Okay, cool. Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? Can, can if you were to plot, uh, if you were to plot a data frame in in hydrogen, would, would the visualization show up? I was just uh, w within hydrogen? Yes. Yeah, uh, let me show you how to do that. I think it's really cool. Um, actually, I'm not going to show you, but <laughs> it's, it's going to be too long. If you go to the hydrogen long. page, you can basically go um, from matplotlib import, uh, what is it, pyplot as plt. And then you can call your regular Jupyter Magic cells and go matplotlib inline, and plotting will show up as normal, which I think is the coolest thing. So you can run again like a plot dot plot, and then when you run that bit of code, it will run inline. Okay, so you said this will interact with your GitHub repository. So if you're trying to see what the changes are, like I'm, I know you there, you're just doing like a single line change or a single value change, but if you're trying to see, can you still go into your GitHub repository then and see where the different changes were in the code? Oh yeah, so, so this is a source tree that I've opened up. Um, you can actually go back to an old commit and see exactly what changed. Thank you. You're making it hard on me, aren't you? <laughs> what triggers the actual uh, commit? Is it the executing the file, or is it every time the file is saved? Uh, it's every time that you actually call the model. So saving doesn't do anything. I kept running through Python model.py, um, and as soon as mummify is called at the very end of your file. Again, this, this needs to be the last argument, the last thing that you do. Um, it will commit everything in the repository to .mummify. And if, if you wanna know how it works, just go into the, my Git repository on GitHub and you can see exactly the steps that happen. It's, it's like, it's very vanilla Git, I just hide it from you because like Git is really hard and confusing. It's like too much. Can you give um, log messages with your um, mummify? So, so not, not uh, just the the actual change uh, which you can uh, look up, but um, like the standard commit message, which is the uh, uh, again like you have access to basically this print function, this log function. All it's doing in the background is actually instantiating a logger for you. So feel free to pass whatever you want into here, so y you can transform that into a log. But again, like I am, you can ask for different features, you can ask for all this different functionality. I want you to have three things. All you need to remember is mummify.log, uh, mummify switch, and mummify history, that's all you're getting, and I think that's all you need. If you need more, do regular git, because you can operate with regular git through syntax that looks like this, all right? Cool, okay. When you commit to Git, does it commit all the history, every change you made, or only the latest? When uh, you push, when you push, I mean. Say that once more, sorry. So when you push, does it push only the latest? The, uh, let's say I push to the GitHub, right? Or does it actually commit all the history, every change that you have made, the entire sequence? Yeah, it absolutely should. It's just a regular Git repository. But I, this is mostly for local development. I haven't done like extensive testing at removing it to remote. But I, I, it's Git, I'd assume it would, it would work that way. Mm -hmm. 
folks who want to. All right, let's do that. That's okay. We're doing good on time, so if there are questions. Uh, good talk, Max, but I'm going to switch it up a little bit. Let's cool. talk about a little bit about Data Mapper and the, the other utility. Uh, what's the largest data set that you put through that? And like, can it handle yeah. monster files? <laughs> So the question is going back to the getting defensive part and using um, syntax that looks like this. Uh, I've basically pushed through a million rows um, and it runs in, I don't know, 20 seconds to fit it. Uh, so this is a, mi a million rows across, um, what did I have? Essentially 30 different variables. Uh, data frame mapper is pretty lightweight and I think it can handle most things that you throw at it. Of course, if you're dealing with like terabytes of data, it's probably not gonna work. Um, but anything on the order of gigabytes, uh, I'm confident data frame mapper can absolutely work. All right, why don't we give one more round of applause for a great talk. Thank you, Max. Well, again, this, uh, I'd appreciate it if you fill out those survey cards. This closes the talks and the real world track for the day. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow.